and welcome to FPL Mate, your best mate for fantasy Premier League content for the 2023-24 season. My name is Dan and it's time for our final roundup before game week three begins. We're going to be bringing you all of the latest news of the week, including injury stuff and more, as well as answering some of the key questions that you guys have been asking me all week. So let's get started, guys. If you enjoy this one, drop a like, do subscribe. We're going to do this every single week. Let's get going. Okay, so I think the first thing I want to talk about today is the fixture swings. I think that's a big thing that's going on in game week three that we're all paying attention to. Most of all, most of us are talking about Chelsea right now because they have got some brilliant fixtures coming up, starting with Luton Town. And the good fixtures keep going all the way through until game week eight. Game week nine, a little bit tougher there. But this period of games is going to be very, very nice for your Chelsea players. So it's going to be a very good idea to maybe try and double up on those Chelsea players. Make sure you've got Chilwell. Maybe go for someone like Jackson or... Or Gusto in the fence, someone else like that, absolutely fine. There's some other outlier players you could possibly go for as well, but definitely Chelsea are looking good right now. Man City also really, really nice. They've got a difficult fixture against Newcastle out the way, and it's plain sailing from here all the way up until game week eight. So we're going to get lots of clean sheets here. So I feel like going for a Man City defender might be a good idea, and a second attacker to add to Erling Haaland could be a great one as well. Foden and Alvarez would be my main two targets. And finally, Spurs. Not too many people talking about the Spurs fixture swing, because they've actually got a really good one that actually lasts slightly longer than Chelsea's and Man City's. The only problem is uh, the Spurs do have Arsenal and Liverpool in there, but outside of that, these fixtures are phenomenal. So another opportunity to maybe go in on some Spurs players. And speaking of fixture swings, I should note that there is a negative fixture swing coming up for Brighton very soon. As you can tell by uh, our Brighton players on screen, they've got very, very sad faces on. But yeah, difficult fixtures after game week three, even game week three, not exactly an easy fixture against West Ham. And then after that, the only fixture you would be confident in Brighton in would be perhaps that Bournemouth game. So just be aware that there are difficult fixtures coming up for Brighton before loading up on their players. It's fine to have them. I'm not saying sell them by any stretch of the imagination, but just be aware that the fixtures are not going to be quite as good as those opening two. And maybe they're not going to be able to score quite as many goals as they were able to in the first two game weeks. I want to get this one out of the way as quickly as I can. A lot of people have been asking me, is it time to wildcard? I would say in general, no, as long as your team doesn't have too many issues in. If you've got like four or five injuries and some terrible players in your team, then fair enough. Maybe that is going to be time for you to wildcard. But for most of us, I would really stop panicking. I think everything is going to be okay. I think we should relax. Two game weeks isn't really enough to get a proper idea of how the season is going to go. A lot of the players that maybe have not performed for you so far doesn't necessarily mean they're bad. It just means that we've only had two game weeks. So maybe have a little bit of patience there. Deal with any individual issues that you have. But if your team is is solid in general and you like the players uh, over the long term, you feel like they're players with a good history, maybe they will make good over the next few game weeks and you won't be thinking about wildcarding at all anymore. So try and save that wildcard if possible. I don't think it's a time to panic quite yet. Um, it's only been two game weeks. That's not enough to really get an idea of how this season's going to go down. Alright, so another key question this game week, same as last week. What do we do with Gabriel of Arsenal? It's a difficult situation. Well, here are Arteta's latest comments. I'll leave them on screen. Feel free to pause and read them if you want to. But basically, um, it does seem like Arteta is trying out some different systems, some different tactics, uh, and uh, some of them don't involve Gabriel starting the start of the games. And also, he sometimes he's coming off the bench and making an impact on, from the bench there. So that's going to be a possibility for Arsenal. They're not confined to playing with Gabriel every single game. Even though we have now got an injury to Timber, we've got a suspension for Tomiyasu, I'm going to show you that actually that doesn't necessarily necessarily mean that Gabriel is now nailed. So this is the system in which Gabriel would play and it's kind of pretty much exactly the same as last year. What Arsenal played pretty much throughout the whole year except Rice would play instead of Party and Havertz would play instead of Xhaka. It's the exact same system. We've seen it a million times before all of last season and it's pretty familiar. And in this kind of system, actually Gabriel fits in really nicely kind of at the left centre back with Zinchenko f slightly further left than him in the defensive transitions but going into attack, Zinchenko will tuck in into the midfield on that left hand side being that in inverted uh, fullback. White on the other side, uh, more of a traditional uh, right back, right centre back kind of uh, position there. So yeah, this kind of system would favour Gabriel, but it's not the only option for Arsenal right now. 
If Arsenal just want to play exactly the same as they have done the first two game weeks, first they tried it with Timber, then with Tomiyasu, no such luck, both players unavailable. Well, Kiwior could technically come in and uh, replace him. So that is a possibility. We could see Kiwior play here, instead play that a uh, left centre back kind of position slash left back position, which Gabriel is not really easily able to play because Party is going to be the inverting right back on the other side of the pitch. So that is something that we could possibly see. And again, that just does not fail. Gabriel if this is the system that Arsenal are going to play again the same as they did game week one and game week two but this time with Kivior instead of the uh, the two other left backs that they've been playing recently it's a possibility for sure and there is also a third possibility as well that has been spoken about a lot among Arsenal fans recently and again it doesn't involve Gabriel and this one involves inverting both Zinchenko and Party, and really only playing with two centre-backs in the kind of attacking phases of play which is obviously something that uh, maybe some of you guys might have kind of had an idea that this could possibly happen but it's just a situation where either Party has got to be dropped or Gabriel has got to be dropped I think that's the situation I think that's what it comes down to right now is Gabriel going to come back into the team or is Partey going to keep his position in the team I don't think both can really happen unless Havertz dropped out but we've got a game against Fulham next and I can't see Arsenal going for a more defensive strategy against Fulham I think that's more likely that we might see Rice, Partey and Gabriel play all together against Manchester United but against Fulham I don't think that's really needed and maybe two inverted fullbacks could work in a slightly more attacking setup uh, for this Arsenal side so just wanted to make you guys aware that this is a possibility as well and this this kind of system you're seeing in front of you now is actually the kind of system that's been predicted by a lot of Arsenal fans but in general Arsenal fans are really split on how Arsenal are going to line up so there is no certainties at the moment nobody really knows it's a really difficult situation for Gabriel owners and you kind of if you are a Gabriel owner I don't think you should take for granted that Gabriel is automatically going to play this game week there is a possibility there's, there's multiple possibilities and systems that Arsenal, Arsenal could use in game week three that do not involve Gabriel and that is a problem so uh, my advice to you guys is possibly if you've got a free spare transfer going right now maybe Maybe now is the time to use it to just get rid of the Gabriel headache because even if Gabriel plays this week, even if he plays game week four as well, there's no guarantee he plays in game week five after that. Arteta has made it clear he wants to play different systems for different games and a lot of those systems don't involve Gabriel. He is going forward unfortunately going to be a rotation risk player which is never something I thought I would say given he started, what was it, 73 Premier League games in a row before this season? Yeah, it's a mad situation but you might have to deal with that. Just wanted to put that one out there. I don't think Gabriel is guaranteed ever anymore. And from one defensive difficulty to another, Luke Shaw has been added to the long and growing list of players in defence that are unavailable. And Luke Shaw is owned by, I believe, around 25% of FPL managers. So a lot of you guys are going to have Luke Shaw in your team right now. Previously, when he was available, I would have said, yeah, give Luke Shaw one more game week. But he's injured and it's going to be for at least a few weeks. It could even be months technically here. So that is a real difficulty. The news only broke last night. So this is very new information. Information. Luke Shaw is going to be unavailable for game week three, probably unavailable for four, five, and maybe six, seven as well. This one could roll for a little while. So I think Luke Shaw is an easy sell. If you have him in your team, he's going to be a priority transfer out. So in terms of replacements for the likes of Shaw or Gabrielle or John Stones or Reese James or Jurian Timber or Tyrone Mings or all of these other defenders that are painfully, painfully not available right now, these are my favorite defenders. So Chilwell, of course, is up there with Estupinian. I think those are your two priority defenders. You should have those two guys no matter what. Make sure you've got those guys. But after that, Gavardio would be my favourite. It looks like he is going to be the most nailed on Man City defender. He's capable of playing multiple positions. He's only 5 million, so a little bit cheaper than the likes of maybe Kyle Walker or uh, Akanji. So you've got a little advantage there. And a lot of people won't see this one coming because they will say, well, Gavardio didn't play in game week one. But we know that that's because Gavardio had only just joined Man City at the time. And now he's bedded in a little bit. He's probably going to be starting most games, particularly when you think about how much money is spent on him and how much talent this guy has as well. So really, really solid transfer for me. I would definitely be taking a close look at him. I'm actually jealous that I, I don't have any uh, injuries in defence in many ways because I would quite like an excuse to get a new Man City defender into my team. I think I could work quite well. Rico Henry is a pretty good option as well going forward. Uh, 
Gusto, I quite like as well at 4 million. Nice cheap option there if you want to save some pennies. And Udogi could be an interesting differential there as well. Really attacking. We've got some great fixtures from for Spurs, as we mentioned. Uh, but Spurs are slightly weaker defensively. So maybe take that into consideration. But I definitely like Udogi as a differential, particularly over these super easy games that Spurs have. Of course, we also know that James Madison is injured as well. Uh, it's probably only going to be for one game week. I can't really see it stretching to more than two games game weeks out. Uh, there is even a small chance that he could start at the weekend, but the uh, the kind of the, the opinion of Spurs fan in, for fans in general does seem to be, okay, look, uh, we don't need to play him. We've got Lo Celso as a backup. We don't need to rush uh, James Madison back. He's an important player. And there is an opinion that uh, Postacoglu is also a manager who eases his players back in. He doesn't rush players back in too quickly. So I would imagine that even if James Madison, you know, gets a training session involved, he's still going to be uh, possibly on the bench or not playing at all at four game week three. Game week four, much more realistic target to get him back. So if you don't have a backup on your bench that you can play for one game week only, kind of deputize for Madison, you might actually be forced to make a transfer here. The other midfielders kind of on the chopping block are probably Manchester United players right now, aren't they? Rashford and Fernandez. are uh, people talking about selling them a lot. Once again, my opinion is going to be the same. I don't think they should be sold. We've got a nice fixture for United against Nottingham Forest next. And actually, I know people are criticizing Man United players, but actually their underlying numbers among other midfielders are actually pretty good. You can see a table in front of you guys right now. This is expected goal involvements of all midfielders in order, top to bottom. Brian and Bumo is, of course, right at the top with his uh, two penalties. Salah uh, right near the top as well because he took a penalty and then he also had the penalty rebound. Both of those chances counted towards his kind of uh, expected goal involvement stat. So that's kind of giving him a nice boost. And after that, we've only really got March and Mitoma above Bruno Fernandes, who has been super unlucky not to get attacking returns so far. Rashford is also reasonably high uh, with uh, kind of 1.2 expected goal involvements. Now, that might not seem so high when you look on a list like this, but you will notice that people not on this list include like James Madison, all of the Arsenal midfielders. Rashford is actually outperforming all of those players in terms of underlying numbers. So I do feel like it is worth giving these players one more chance against Nottingham Forest. If it looks really bad again, then fair enough. Maybe we can consider selling them against Arsenal in game week four. But I don't think it's time to give up on them yet. They are too good of players to suddenly become terrible players. We just need to see Man United sort themselves out. And there's no reason to say that won't happen in a favourable fixture against Forest. So I would be looking to keep these players personally. If you disagree, then, you know, this is just my opinion. And if you want to sell them, if particularly if you want to free up some cash or whatever, I understand. I'm not going to stop anyone. I'm just giving my opinion. I have both of these players and I'm not looking at selling either. If you are looking for a new midfielder, these are my favourites. So Phil Foden would come in at number one. I think he's got some really high upside over two nice fixtures in particular, Sheffield United and Fulham. Those two are phenomenal fixtures where there's going to be a loss of goals for Manchester City. And the best way to capitalise on that is not going to be through Erling Haaland because everyone has him. Everyone's going to be captaining him. Getting that differential with someone like Foden is going to give you that advantage. And Buma obviously been doing very well so far, so no doubt that he's going to be on this list. I like Saka. I like Erdogan. Guard. These players look like pretty decent options for this Fulham game coming up. Bruno Fernandes, I actually feel like if you don't have him, I would consider buying him. And Sterling as a bit of a differential there as well. Up against Luton next, I thought he played really well against West Ham actually. And has taken more touches in the penalty box than any other player in the Premier League so far this season. So he is getting forward, he is getting involved and he could potentially get some attacking returns in this big game against Luton. Quick note on forward replacements, players you might be bringing in for your forwards. There's only three players which I feel strongly about that I would be very, very keen to bring into my fantasy team this week. And then they are Nicholas Jackson, Julian Alvarez for similar reasons to Foden, and of course, Johan Wisser here as well. So these are the three I would be liking to bring into my FPL team this week. If you want to get these players in, I say go for it. They're all really, really good options. But who are you going to sell for them? Well, it's not going to be Erling Haaland. Who else do you have in your team? Well, it's probably going to be Jao Pedro and uh, Wally Watkins, to be fair. And I have to say, 
I don't know if I feel too strongly about selling either of these players right now. Ollie Watkins, I know he hasn't started off the season brilliantly, but Aston Villa, after that Newcastle game, they bounced back, looked really good, and we're expecting a good season from Aston Villa in general. We also saw uh, Ollie Watkins score a hat-trick in his Europa Conference League qualifier against Hibernian, and I know it's a kind of an easy opponent, but those first three goals of the season are going to give him a real confidence. It's proof that the Aston Villa system does still favour Ollie Watkins to score goals, and it also so is hopefully going to be the start of what we might call some form for Ollie Watkins as well. So there is no strong reason to sell Watkins unless you are either desperate to get one of those other guys. We just spoke about those other forwards that look good. If you really love those players, then maybe you'll be willing to sacrifice Watkins if you've got a spare transfer. You don't really know what to do with it. You've got no other you know, issues in your team. You just want to make an upgrade. Fair enough. Absolutely go for it. And if you want to free up some money for some other transfers you want to make, then that's another good reason to sell Watkins. But I would not be selling Watkins for no good reason. I feel like if you're selling him, you need a good reason to do it. I would not just do it for, you know, no reason at all. João Pedro, kind of similar situation since we got the news that Enciso is going to be injured. So with Enciso injured, that means João Pedro is going to have his expected minutes kind of go up quite a lot. And we know when he's on the pitch, he's likely to be taking penalties as well. So we've got a penalty taker from Brighton. That's going to be pretty nice, at least against West Ham. Maybe you can consider shifting him on. I think long term, there is definitely Definitely scope to sell João Pedro, but right now I don't think there's any desperate need to sell him. So once again, unless you love those other guys, you've got a spare transfer to go for, you don't really know what to spend it on, then fair enough. You can sell João Pedro and go for someone else. But I wouldn't feel too strongly about it. I don't think you need to sell him if you don't want to. I want to have a look at the top predicted points. Um, once again, we have got these numbers from uh, Fantasy Football Hub. Uh, the last two uh, uh, kind of screenshots you saw were the Optus stats. This one is the predicted points tool, another one of their many tools. I know I use a lot of their tools in these videos because they're really good to demonstrate things and show you things like that. Um, and I do want to make a note. I know we've, we've shown you a couple of tools. We've shown you a little snippets of some of the data that they provide. And this is a snippet of the predicted points that they provide for game week three for, for, for this. This example if you want to check this out let, let, just go in the description just, just have a look for yourself the tools are amazing and you get 50% off your uh, your subscriptions um, all the way until the end of August so you've got, you've got five six days now to go ahead and get 50% off your subscription after that that deal is gone so make sure if you are interested in these tools using them long term and trying to improve your fantasy game with some good kind of assistance then you know you need to get you need to get moving guys you need to get these tools now I love them and I wrote couldn't recommend them enough. I really couldn't um, use them all the time. But yeah, we've got Erling Haaland, most predicted points for this game week, 8.3. Rashford uh, there at 6.7. Fernandez 6.5. So maybe more reason to be keeping those Manchester United guys because uh, the AI thinks they're going to have a good game. They've got, these, got good predictions and it's kind of using the stats from last year, the stats from this year, taking it all into consideration to try and make some predictions here. Uh, hopefully as without bias. I know we, we as people get a bit emotional about you know players blanking and stuff like that well you know Rashford Fernandez good underlying numbers there's no reason to say where they can't smash uh Nottingham Forest there we've got Erdegaard here as well he's been creeping up the predicted points tables recently since he took a penalty off uh, uh, off Saka I feel like that maybe Erdegaard could take some more penalties in future and that has definitely increased his appeal against Fulham at home 5.8 predicted points. That is pretty decent right there, isn't it? So there are your top predicted points. Players does leave us to say, if you want to captain a player, make it Erling Haaland. Um, you could go for another one of these players on this list, but I don't know. Erling Haaland is way out in front with that Sheffield United fixture. Just for a bit of fun here, guys, I thought I'd show you some differentials for game week three. Maybe we'll do this every week. Maybe not. This series is a bit of a work in progress. So I don't really know what I want to include in it every Friday. But um, I've decided this week I will just show you three differentials I like the look, of, uh, look of. And we've mentioned all of them so far in this video. If you are looking to go for a player that is a little bit different that maybe your mini league rivals are not going for. And the overall player base those guys are not going for. Then these players would be your friends. This is a forward, a midfielder. And a defender, all differentials. Uh, Julian Alvarez, high upside against Sheffield United. Sterling, high upside against Luton. And Udogi, if he can start adding some attacking returns uh, to his game and some clean sheets as well. Things are going to look very, very good for him indeed. He's definitely got the potential. He's showing a lot of promise in attack. I do really like the look of this player. Uh, I think Spurs fans, you've got a real gem on your hands here. He's going to be an absolute star of the Premier League. So yeah, if you want a differential, these are the three players that I like the look of the most. 
And let's just finish you off with some random other headlines that are, I've kind of read about in the last day or two that maybe you guys knew about, maybe you didn't, but we'll flag it to you anyway. So in CISO, the injury could be so bad that you could be out until 2024. So maybe that increases the long-term viability of Jao Pedro. We've got Salah might be leaving for Saudi Arabia. That news dropped last night. I don't think that's likely to happen. I feel like Salah is going to be quite loyal to Liverpool, won't force through a move there at all. But look, I still think it's an interesting interesting talking point. I'd be interested to hear some of your thoughts about this, particularly Liverpool fans. What do you think? Do you think there is any chance Salah leaves the Premier League? And if that happens, what are the ramifications going to be? If that means that we won't have any players above 9 million other than De Bruyne, who is injured, and Erling Haaland, who everyone has. So, could really, really tip the scales in FPL quite a lot. It would be perma-captain Haaland for the rest of the season, wouldn't it? Uh, Mudrik and Chukwameka, they have got injuries for Chelsea, but Broya is back in training. So, maybe that's going to impact Jackson's minutes. Maybe not this game week, but maybe in future game weeks. Jesus is back in full training as well, so that's going to uh, impact the likes of Nketiah. But also, it's going to be a good thing for Martinelli, because with Jesus, the unselfish way he plays, the way he drifts around the forward positions as well, often really leads to Martinelli getting more opportunities to score goals. So Jesus' bag is bad for Nketiah because he's going to drop to the bench, but very good for Martinelli who uh, really thrives off Jesus' uh, kind of backup play. And we've got Archer here as well. Cameron Archer, the 4.5 million forward, he might be getting his moves to Sheffield United, which means if that goes through and it's going to be around £18 million, big money move for Sheffield United you would think that he is going to be starting every game for his new club. So Archer could be the new 4.5 million forward to go for playing every single game. And if he does anything like he did last season against, uh, well, for Middlesbrough and shows the promise that he's been showing so far in his career, then actually he could genuinely be a player 4.5 million forwards that we could actually play in certain fixtures. That would be crazy if that happens. So definitely one to keep an eye on if Archer does complete that move. is looking more and more likely as time goes on. So I'm pretty sure we covered just about everything. I uh, kept you up to date on all of the weekly happenings in FPL for game week three. If I missed any big questions of the week, please do let me know by dropping a comment. I'll be replying to as many as I physically can. Um, if you do enjoy this series, make uh, sure you leave a like. Let me know by leaving a like. Make sure you subscribe for more stuff. I'm hoping to improve this, se this season with this series as time goes on. Try and refine it a little bit and give it more of a sense of direction because it is very new and I'm not really sure what I need to include in it and what I don't really. Hopefully what I've been doing so far is roughly okay though and at least a little bit helpful to a lot of you guys. But aside from that guys, make sure you check out my uh, team selection video. That's going to be right there uh, uploaded yesterday to see how I'm lining up for game week three. But aside from that, thank you so much for watching. Once again, see you on on Deadline Stream tonight, and I'll see you later, mates. Bye-bye.